Okay, so hello and welcome to this artist talk. Um, my name is Desiree Demarat. Um, I am a co-founder of the Interstruct Collective. And in my work, I'm working in between artistic practice, uh, research, but also programming. And I am here with a performance maker, musician, visual artist, Julian Hetzel, um, whose show Mount Everest is going to be presented in Teatro Municipal de Porto. Um, in Campo Alegre on the 25th and 26th of March, um, which is a sequence of the program within other performances. So, hello, hello Julian. <laughs> um, so before we get into, or before we get in, a little more into the question of today, which is the topic of how we deal with the past and how history carved in stone becomes a problem today, um, I would like for you to start maybe to tell us a bit more about yourself, but also about your process of artistic creation. So how did you come to produce this piece? Um, and also, where does the title come from? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I have a background in, in visual arts and visual communications. I played for many years in a, in a band, uh, in an electro pop band called Pentatons. And it happened to me that I work more and more in theater in the field of performing arts. So I think since about yeah, 12 years, I'm focusing mainly on that 10 years. Um, and I still work between visual arts and theater in certain moments. So sometimes my work is presented in galleries, sometimes in classical theater settings. But, but the nature of the work is not necessarily classical text theater. So I'm often looking for ways how to yeah, create or find these I don't know, gray spaces in between the, the black box and the white cube that I find really interesting. Um, and with Mount Average, I think um, it was really a piece that started through the material research. So like literally looking on a conceptual level into um, how can the question like how can we find a future for the past and in this case um, the, the past is then a concrete material so we searched for ways how can we deal with the past and the present how can we deal with yeah in this case monuments like literally monuments of statues and political leaders how can we yeah, find a way to deal with them um, in today's time, where, as you mentioned in your introduction, these objects sometimes um, become an obstacle or like um, a problem that needs to be, that we need to find ways to deal with it. So um, how the creative process really started from working with statues, with materials, with like researching on iconoclasm, on the destruction of images, on ways what gets visible if you break an image, right? So what is the materiality of an image of, of a statue? So what, what, what happens if we take down the leaders and we, we grind them to, to clay or to, to uh, plaster or whatever they are made of wood or the gods, right? So there is something in, in the material that uh, I started working with. And literally we, we started playing um, in the studio with clay and different ways of how um, how to make statues, how to, yeah, I don't know, sculpt stuff and, and, and the concrete material. So um, really started from this question, how to, how to give shape also to the unknown. That sounds all really abstract, but mm -hmm. I always start with these big questions with these big <clears throat> concepts and try to find rather concrete forms of how to manifest these ideas. Um, and I think the title is, is another question that you uh, pointed to that maybe gets more um, apparent when you see the piece and where you understand, okay, there is this, the top of the, the top, the, the, the highest of all mountains, the, the biggest of all gods, the, the leader of all the leaders. Um, what does he think of itself, right? Like, is it nice up there or is it also a question of time until one one peak becomes taken over by another one and one uh, ideology is being put on top of another i just see here i live in a, in a new i'm in a new studio and i see how 
uh, a subways is being replaced by a Burger King. And so maybe what, what comes next, right? So the question of Mount Everett is like, also basically a, a joke between, or I say a, a wink between the highest of, of all and the, the door snake, the average, that is like really profane, right? So in what do we, how do we strive to the top and why is it so relative where we are in the end? And um, somewhere there, don't know if this was a good explanation mm -hmm. of the title, sorry. But okay. I think there's an interesting friction in the title, you know, and I think the friction, Titles are always important for me also because they are a point of reference in how I make pieces. So if I don't know where to go, I look again at the title and maybe there's an answer in why I chose that title. So also in this sense, at the top, it's also only average. That's not even so great, right? Maybe. <laughs> Never reach that okay. high. But... <laughs> yeah, so question here, um, why did you decide on this focus? And what is then the intended impact on the spectators working with the material? So more in the sense of, I would see glove on the screen. So more rather in the clinical or objective manner to not, to, I think also with, uh, with outside, right? So just to see the object, the material to touch um, or even on the other side, more subjective or intimate, personal. Well, it's again, I think, a twofold answer. <laughs> One has to do with uh, modes of spectatorship, um, and the other um, with the connection of um, the haptic connection of, of the of the spectator and the material. So, generally, I'm in my work. I'm interested in finding or, or challenging established forms of spectatorship and and how how to address the audience. What does it mean to be an audience member and um, to overcome this passive consumerist attitude that uh, often yeah, happens in, in theaters or in performing arts. Um, so for me, this uh, the, the paradox of the spectator where you're in a situation, so you observe something, but in some moments you also find yourself being part of these situations is a place that I find highly interesting. So this, I think that the space where you know, what is the difference between a, a spectator and a witness? Like, why is this as in the one is maybe more passive, is just or chose to be there, is there on his own will, and the witness sees something that um, leads to responsibility for the person that witnessed the events happening. So, and this place where you are like in in a situation where we know about so many things, I mean, even today, I know, I, I, I checked the news this morning, so I know, like every morning, um, so I know what's going on in the world, but what does it do to me? And how far does it affect me, right? And then how far is not doing anything makes me being an accomplice in the events of happening, you know? So I, like we speak about the, the, wherever you look, like the Mediterranean, Ukraine, uh, there is so many uh, places in uh, today's uh, world that we could speak about, but this moment of being in between, I find interesting. And therefore, when I, uh, when you asked us to get to the next question that you had, <laughs> with, with <laughs> how to relate to the material and why is touch uh, or has the haptic uh, relation um, proposed in that piece where the audience really gets the chance to touch or to get in, get their hands dirty and touch the material. I think this is really a, a, a way to, to find ways how can the audience not only feel part of the situation or to be addressed in different ways, but of really making an impact or having a, a, a say contributing in whatever possible way to the narrative that is being created and to, to the events that are being discussed. So I think this deep connection that happens through an haptic um, interaction with the material, yeah, does something to the audience. So what happens, also the whole set, the whole piece is constructed. So you're not outside, you're with the people in the room. So it's like a parkour performance where you maneuver through different spaces, spoiler alert, um, but you go from room to room, and in some, you're close with the performers. You're very, I say, on, on, a, on a short distance. You're like really in a situation rather than, so it's, not, it's a question about representation, actually, right? Like, is it showing things or is it experiencing things? Is it, 
and therefore um, to, to, to invite people to touch the material that we're speaking about is um, more like an immersive form that is somehow interesting and effect efficient, I think, to, to make people. So in the sense of not being only passive, uh, walking past the monuments, what we are speaking about, but to really take action and to transform it on their own, right? If yeah. we could only do that in the, in the real world, that would be fantastic, right? Um, I think also the, the aspect of uh, what I was curious about, what is happening with the objects afterwards, because also the other aspect of monuments could be that um, it's not in the much in the sense of doing, but the material itself. Um, sometimes there exist little souvenirs of statues of the public space. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm thinking about now, now in this case of my own research, which is um, about the colonial exhibition in Porto, where there were made statues inside the park for this exhibition, but these were also given away as souvenir afterwards. But this is a, the made souvenir, so um, a replication of it. So here's the process a little bit different, not using this material um, this, in this sense at the time was propaganda, propagandistic material, but rather to how can we transform this oppressive, oppressive stereotypes and yeah, make a, an object on our own. Sure, I mean, I don't know what people do when they take the souvenir or the trophy home from the place <laughs> where they uh, yeah, witness something of happening. But in this case, it's really like an, a way to exercise transformation, you know, like collectively or individually, like to show, hey, we are part of um, creating history and maybe we can find yeah, new forms. Or it's, it's basically, I think, the, the, the reason why to choose also a factory for a place is really that um, there is something to work with or on our history and possibly we need to work through the the trauma of the past, right? So to invite people to do that collectively or individually, doesn't matter, but to basically give um, the possibility to exercise this process of change, of transformation actively, I think it's, it's yeah, it inspires change possibly, or to, I think it's something that, that is a very, um, maybe it's a literal way of, hey, this is a, hands-on uh, exercise to, mm -hmm. to do it, but why not, right? So, um... yeah, and also this whole process from a statue, <clears throat> um, the process of the materi materiality to be powder, and then again, to have the whole thing about the clay and the wet material. So I think it's also yeah. an interesting point. Now we, we have this flow when we make powder from power. Right, so to, to take what, what I mentioned uh, in, in, I think in the first question, that what remains when we, when we, it's an act of profanation, right? So we take the gods and we transform them into wood or into plaster, into cement, into marble, into I don't know what, but they become the particles again, right? So by the factory that we uh, set up is really like an, an ongoing process of undoing this monument. So this is the literal labor that is happening. So there is something in the idea of it, it, it is work. Sorry, it's work to deal with the past. It's not the most pleasant work, but it's necessary to, to do it maybe. And um, to create a whole factory that rotates around or that digests monuments to transform them into a new materiality, literally what you mentioned, into powder in a first step, then into a sort of a paste, like a we call it the past paste. It's some kind of grayish uh, clay-like uh, something, a dough. But in an, in an ideal world, this consists of all the leaders that we've grinded, right? So like there is a powder, it's kind of a Frankenstein powder that contains all the previous leaders that went through this factory where we undo, where we grind down these statues in a very slow process. But mm -hmm. the idea is it's not about destroying the monuments. It's um, about finding mm -hmm. new forms, about exploring the potential uh, power of, of movements versus the static um, representation of power in monuments, right? And I think it's, um, it's about, yeah, this idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and as you mentioned also before, um, it's a very um, 
kind of an intimate space, a private space, as there are only a few spectators, as you said, in the exhibition space um, or in different performance rooms, um, as well as monuments are being used in the piece. So um, taking now this consideration of monuments, which are usually found in the public space at first, um, and the public space being itself also um, well, a, a space which everybody can use, so a space marked by and made of people who are using the space and social interactions within it and people who are producing the space. Um, so in the public self, in the public self itself, there's a big uh, like multiplicity and complexity also lying within. Um, <clears throat> well, and then we find the monuments there, which even although it's a collective social product, um, some representations of this conceived space, space show the power dynamics, as you mentioned, also the power, making powder from power um, to create influence by perspectives um, of that specific country, but can distort reality or um, is also showing that some narratives are not included in that narration of the public space in the monuments, that some narratives are not accessible or mm -hmm. hidden. Um, so even here in the public space, we see a complex context of uh, mm -hmm. colonial legacies in the monuments. Um, yeah, and also again, as their con uh, continu continuity, um, we see also post-colonial interrelationships and the continuing coloniality. So now in the piece, you are taking the monuments of the public space uh, or parts of it and are kind of putting them into a private space. So while extracting and maybe appropriating symbols of the public space, um, supposedly of a collective memory into an intimate space, the performance stage. Um, so this can be then create also a new space, this private space. So um, an imaginary space or how how is it lived so um yeah here the question actually more how does this relation or actually transformation also play a role right because transformation from public space to private space um what exactly do you want to extract from the public space and what does it mean to use these representations in a private space for the spectator wow a beautiful analyze of the of this whole uh, complex subject um, of how to deal with the monuments that actually uh, has they represent past powers or ideologies right um and i think that um wow it's it's a broad i try to get to your question but <laughs> i also need to ventilate a bit because i think there is something crucial that, that we probably both agree on that um yeah, the, that a critical examination of colonialism and racism must become part of our everyday life, right? Especially in public space. <laughs> and that through colonial monuments or street names, the, yeah, the perspective of the perpetrators and the violence is inscribed in public mm -hmm. perception again and again, right? And with the presence of such symbols, the, the exploitation and the violence in the public space, the crimes against humanity, are acknowledged and i think this is again a sign of, of racism and the failure to take responsibility um, for the colonial past so and i think that if history is not dealt with um racist structures will remain and we will always rotate around the same i don't know i think denial is not an option right so we need to find ways to 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 relate to these materials that are there as a memory as a mm -hmm. i think that the latin word monument means literally to remember to preserve the memory of something that these objects are made out of marble out of bronze out of concrete you know like points all to the idea that these monuments shall overcome or survive humankind at least my life or i don't know it's for several generations so they point to uh, the oblivion, to the eternity, right? So there is a goal in, I mean, it's basically the question, what, how is a monument constructed in the public space? There are these strange, um, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, it's like an occupation of an army from a previous history, but they are still there, they are mute, 
but very powerful in the public space erected. Um, so what, what do these visitors do that stand there and they, they just remind us on the power structures that are here or have been present, right? Mm -hmm. And so we went through different layers also in what is the construction of a monument? What is the construction of the pedestal? Why are things so high? Why, what, is, like, what is the whole um, idea about, right? And what does it mean if we take them down, invite them into our uh, theater or art space, and undo them. So we, we I say also consciously say, hey, we're not um, destroying them because I think I, I don't really have a proposition or I say like a, a solution for this complex question, but it's just, hey, we need to somehow find ways to um, work on the material. And yes, by bringing them into an intimate space. And it's lit we also try to get um, real copies, not real copies, we try to get real monuments that have been taken down and to work with them, but uh, the music was not possible at the time. It was a bit, we tried, gave, made really an effort to get a whole show. We could have got some um, from Eastern Europe, but it was not really uh, what we were working on. Sure, they could have functioned as a representation. We also, uh, we, we, we bought a, a, a bronze uh, of Adolf Hitler that we tried to shred up. It's, was a bit as the racism was too hard to grind with the tools that we had. It was also interesting that simply our machines failed at a certain moment. But what I want to say that we, in the end, we work with um, copies of real statues that are still in public space or are being, uh, how say, taken down from the uh, pedestal. So the pedestals remain, but the objects are gone. What does this emptiness or the, how say, the, the void uh, refers to because everybody knows what has been on the pedestal. So, in how far does her uh, say an absence create a uh, hyper visibility? It doesn't matter. This is not what your question was about. Your question was basically <laughs> in how far the this intimate space um, gives us a new uh, way to relate to these materials. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Also, maybe what are the possibilities lying within the space? So, is it also closely connected to the personal experiences also in the public space it's very mm -hmm. important but in this private space maybe even more because it's a smaller group people are directly engaging with the material so we can also only understand and question ourselves if we know that we are also kind of embedded in the system so the mm -hmm. visitors constantly being challenged to probably have to go through the whole performance and cannot just go back or so so kind of compelled to think and to experience so also here um an aspect of using performance during theater as a tool um because even the body is referring here also with the presence of the body and also the fluidity of the body the movement um in contrast to the static monument or even the contrast to the static perceptions and narratives we are finding within. Um, maybe just to go into it in a little bit in different direction now, as a maybe last topic. Um, as we were talking before, the histories are also institutionalized and racism is institutionalized. Um, what do you think about in the creation of the work? Um, what do you think about diversity and representation in, within an artistic process? And how can an artistic institution maybe also um, work on this topic in, in on this topic of racism? So I, I can also say again from our experience or from my experience, um, this is a very on top, uh, important topic within the work of the collective I'm working with. Um, we have a rich diversity of experiences of people. We are all coming from different countries, different areas. So we speak from different positions when developing and delivering the processes or the projects um, and trying to avoid to speak for or on behalf of other communities. So is this also a topic you are addressing and does representativity or diverse lived experiences also be, is, is it being part of the creation of the work? Look, I, I think in this piece, um, 
it was a collaboration with people with different and diverse backgrounds. I mentioned earlier uh, Pichot's uh, perspective as a Congolese living in uh, Belgium was super enriching for this part. Um, but again, we are in a, in a making this piece in, in Ghent in a, in a theater that I say the location of the theater itself has colonial past, right? So there was, it's a super, I say, I, I understand your, your point and I think it's super relevant, but I find myself often implicated in structures that are, you know, like in how far can you question the system that you're part of, right? So, and again, I, I said it earlier, I'm from the perspective that I can speak from, I can possibly identify much more with the perpetrators than with the, with the victims, right? So I'm in many cases um, much more part of the problem than of the solution. So when we speak about inclusivity, I can, I have, I try to have in my team a diverse perspective and make people to be part of our creation process and of my studio. Um, and again, I work in the Netherlands as a German with a specific background. So I think it is a question of which perspective can I take, right, as a maker. Mm -hmm. So for me to address my own white gaze on the world and the dominant white gaze is part of what I do, right? So the in previous works, like, for example, All Inclusive, which has also a very obvious title to speak about um, diversity and inclusivity, but All Inclusive was a work that was highly criticized for the ways how we work together with um, people with, the, in this case, with refugee backgrounds. But the piece is all about making the white Western gaze visible, right? And therefore, we created certain power structures that reflect on the problem. But sometimes I recreate, or I say, I'm, it's, it's something that we, I call subversive affirmation. So it's an exaggeration of an existing model of an existing power structure in order, to, in order to make it visible and maybe to make it crash possibly, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least to question it. Um, so I think it is very important to, to bring up these questions. And I think especially for a maker with my background, I think it is about finding creative ways to have a voice in this system, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is important to give focus, to give attention, to give space and support to makers and to, to collectives, to artists whose stories have not been told yet and whose opinion and perspective is not the dominant uh, story or the dominant narrative. Um, yeah, and therefore I can only uh, support to keep on changing. But again, this is work, right? It doesn't happen by itself. It means we need to change institutions. We need to change our own practice. I have to continue um, challenging my own practice in allowing other perspectives, other gazes, other ideas. That means a more inclusive, more diverse uh, perspective to be part of my um, creations in order to also to stay uh, yeah, relevant and in order to stay open for a broader audience and for a broader uh, discourse. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. Um, yeah, I'm bringing this into it because this is a big focus on in the work um, I'm, I'm working or the collective I'm working. Um, so who has the agency, agency also to speak? Um, how can we... Um, yeah, even um, collaborate or also who can we ask for? So can we have workshops? Can we guide workshops? Can we participate in workshops to have a broader, broader information to have it more horizontal, um, to really engage and even, yeah, work with a broad spectrum of people um, yeah. with the final work to have it really as a work, collaborative work. Um, but therefore, I think to to question like the ownership of materials, right? Like who has like the the the, the problem of appropriation? Who has the right to speak about certain uh, subjects on? Who owns this material, right? Mm -hmm. 
and who should profit from these stories being shared? I think it's super Ethical important. Ethical questions around. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think I'm especially interested in this how to say, link between ethics or morals and economics, because I think they are intrinsically intertwined in our society. So when we speak about guilt, the German word for it is like Schuld and Schulden, right? So that also says, which is the same word for ethical and um, economical obligations. And it seems like we, as between Germans, I don't know what is in Portuguese, <laughs> but like the concept for guilt and debt is the same in one word, right? So how can it seems that like, mm -hmm. like we try to treat the one pain with the other, right? So you can cure it, but I don't think this works. Anyways, just as an example. <laughs> yeah, I think I get, I get what you mean. So the social responsibility also behind it. Um, yeah. And yeah, just considerate considerations we as artists should have when producing the work. Um, at what point should we advance in the public debate or how far can we and what is the own positionality and within it? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think you're kind of agreeing also on this topic. Um, okay, I think um, we are already kind of advanced in time. So I think we already started with a good part around the discussion about um, the concept of the work to get also the people curious to go to see the, the show on the 26th and 26th of March. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you would like to add or anything else? The, Visitors should know before we oh, like wrap up. <laughs> no, really nice to have this exchange with you and get to know you uh, virtually. So <laughs> maybe we'll find the chance to meet each other in person around the days. Probably of the in March. I also would yeah. try to see the piece. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Looking forward. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So then. Thank you very much for this conversation. I also agree. Likewise. It was interesting. <laughs> Okay, thank you.